us in Perry, especially. Thank you all for coming in through the various meetings that we're all here. We gather the three of you because you've all started something that in varying ways lies at the intersection of media technology. I am sitting next to you, Chet Kanoja of Aereo. On the computer monitor, we have Sarush Alvi, uh, one of the founders of Vice. And doing the voice of God thing on these massive speaker system is uh, Eli Pariser of Upward. I know we're all in different places, but I want to stress that um, this should be a discussion, not a group Q&A. And we encourage you all to get into back and forth conversations with your fellow co-founders. Sarush, let me start off with you since you're dialing in from the farthest way away. The story of how Vice started is fairly well known. You know, you, it basically began as a free newspaper called Voice of Montreal. If you could take us back to the very beginning, what was the level of your ambitious for Vice when you first started out? Going back 20 years, it's uh, actually my 20-year anniversary from, from the time that I started work on the very first issue. We call ourselves a 20-year-old startup. I didn't know. I had no experience in publishing or in media, and I thought either it was going to be a single issue that I published that I'd be able to walk around and say, hey, I did this, or maybe, maybe this thing could be huge one day. But I did not have specific ambitions that 20 years later we would want to be in 36 countries and have a show on HBO and multiple verticals. It was hard to really visualize what it would look like apart from the fact that we felt it needed to exist, that there was a void out there and we had to fill that space and that we believed that there was an audience out there. And I think that's, I think, our greatest accomplishment on some level is that we found that audience on a global level that was, we were niche players for, for so long and, and still are to a degree, although in the last year or two, we've kind of broken through for a few different reasons. We always used to joke, like, we, we're going to take over the world. We were on welfare in Montreal and eating, you know, eating uh, beans and rice for, for years, but we'd still be like, we're going to take over the world. It was this kind of us versus them, global domination, <laughs> but it was hard to define what it was going to look like. And cut to 20 years later, and we're finally, we're no longer the redheaded stepchildren of media or outliers or niche players, but more coming more towards the center of the conversation. Um, Chet, actually, you know, you, you um, started Aereo. You already had one successful entrepreneurial experience. So I'm guessing that just by the way that you started was quite different. Um, can you talk about the formation of Aereo, what you were thinking? Because you did it in a completely different way from um, Sarush in that, you know, there was real funding and all that kind of stuff. So, so, so if on. you end up selling a company, I think that's unsuccessful. <laughs> <laughs> because he, he was, you know, Sarush is lucky, right? He's still doing what he started doing, and, and you can reinvent that, and you can keep going and going. But when you hit a wall and you have to sell, that that's a difficult moment. Mm -hmm. uh, although it's celebrated that, you know, you provided an exit. What people don't understand is how much of a loss it is for people that live and breathe it every day. And yes, you know, the bank balance looks nice and all that kind of good stuff, but that, that feeling is fleeting. You get back to the angst of, you know, I want to be doing something again. So, which is really why uh, Aereo, you know, there was a lot of technical reasons for to doing Aereo, but a lot of the personal reasons were that, uh, you know, it was an unfinished story. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's always chasing that unfinished story, trying to finish writing that last chapter that you think it should be and how you think it should be written. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the only outlet is start something again. And obviously the side benefits of that when you make people money is that they trust you with more money. and invest in you and invest in your ideas. That's a luxury that I think comes with it. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think any founder out there who really deeply cares about what they started out to do enjoys in retrospect saying, mm, I'm glad I sold it. I think a lot of people say, boy, that was a fun ride. Too bad I couldn't make it X, Y, or Z, or mm -hmm. 